Kentucky National Board, uh, chair of the Education Committee, and my colleague Ed Goldberg um, is our co-chair on the Education Committee and our treasurer for ACP National. Rebecca Merrill is with MHQ, our staff, and she is our technical super director. Um, so let's see, can we move the slide forward to... Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I want to thank our ACP sponsors. And I have the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Gleb Sipersky, who is, this is the second time he's done a webinar for us. A uh, little background on Dr. Gleb. He is an internationally renowned thought leader in future proofing. He specializes in helping forward-looking leaders secure their organization's future by forecasting and addressing threats and maximizing opportunities. He serves as the CEO of the Future Proofing Consultancy Disaster Avoidance Expert. A best-selling author of several traditionally published books, Dr. Gleb is most well-known for his 2019 bestseller, Never Go With Your Gut how pioneering leaders make the best decisions and avoid business disasters, published by Career Press. And his 2020 best-selling book, The Blind Spot Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships, published by New Harbinger. His groundbreaking thought leadership was featured in over 550 articles and 450 interviews in prominent venues. They include USA Today, Time, Fast Company, CBS News, Fortune, Inc. Magazine, CNBC, and many more. Dr. Gleb's expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting, coaching, and training. His clients include innovative startups, major nonprofits, and Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflac to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his research background as a behavioral scientist with 15 years in academia, including seven as a professor at Ohio State University. In his free time, he makes sure to spend abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. To help you take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, I've asked him to share uh, with us the topic on how to defeat work from home burnout and Zoom fatigue. So I'm gonna hand this over to Dr. Glug. Thank you very much. Thank you for that kind introduction, Robbie. Really appreciate it. All right, everyone. So let's talk about how you as continuity professionals can defeat work from home burnout and Zoom fatigue effectively. It's a tough topic. We've all been doing a lot of work from home, various of us for more time, some for other less time since the shutdowns in March 2020 and some even earlier, but most of us since then time. It's been on and off transitioning to the office, transitioning home when there's outbreaks. Now there's a potentially a third surge coming with these new variants. So some com more companies might be transitioning to working from home, back to working from home after the variants while the vaccines are still coming out. So this, this is an important topic and especially important because a lot of companies want to have a number of their employees work from home even after the pandemic. And some of them have moved to permanent work from home like Dropbox, but it's not only technology companies, the, a number of companies are moving some or most of their employees to permanent work from home. And this includes very prominent old style companies like let's say nationwide insurance right here in where I live, Columbus, Ohio. So as a, my, they're one of my clients and they have decided to move a number of their staff to permanent work from home. So they've been having to deal with work from home burnout and Zoom fatigue and so have many other companies will be doing a lot more virtual interactions in any case, since the pandemic is going to transition us into a much more virtual age. That's pretty clear. A lot of employees and employers want to work virtually. And to do that effectively, you need to defeat work from home, burnout, and Zoom fatigue. So let's talk about how we can make that happen. And for that, we need to understand the context of this traditional standard approach to work from home, which happened on a wide massive scale as part of the lockdowns in March 2020. So that's what happened. And work from home has many benefits, as a number of companies realized while, as they're doing the transition. It saves them money 
So it saves them money because they don't have to pay for house. They don't have to pay for real estate that they would have had to pay otherwise. It's not as expensive, so they can shrink their footprint nationwide. Dropbox, many other companies have decided to shrink their footprint, so have many others as a benefit. It also increases productivity overall. So individuals are more productive by about two hours per week because they don't have to do commuting and there's other things associated with coming to the office that they don't have to do. And so productivity increases and the, the company saves money. And of course, if a company does move to, to permanent work from home or most the large majority of the time working from home, it can hire employees from anywhere. A number of companies have decided to do that they have their current employees maybe come to the office one day a week or something like that, or as much as the employees want, but they are hiring also employees everywhere. So they're expanding their talent pool while paying lower salaries for employees who are not located in major cities. So many benefits, but also problems in, of growing burnout. That's a problem. So there's growing burnout. More and more employees are feeling tired. They're having, being stressed and there's mental health challenges and their retention and morale challenges for companies. Now, why is this happening? What leads to this burnout? Because you need to solve the burnout challenge for the long-term success of working from home. Even for the next few months, while this, we still have the pandemic going on, you really need to address that. But more broadly, going forward, work from home burnout and Zoom fatigue need to be addressed if you want to be prepared for the future. And you as continuity professionals are in charge of helping your companies prepare for the future. And of course, the future involves not only more virtual interactions, but in various forms of crises like future pandemics or future long-term impacts, you'll be doing a lot more work from home. The problem with burnout, really serious challenge, is that companies are adapting their existing office culture to remote work. There was an abrupt shift that the emergency shift in March 2020, the vast majority of companies were unprepared for that shift. Now, I hope you helped your companies have emergency continuity plans, business continuity plans. That are, that's what you're about as continuity professionals. But, and I, as a future proofing expert, I've worked on a number of continuity plans. The standard continuity plan that I see before I come to work with a company doesn't have something that prepares it for a pandemic, prepares it for an emergency and have going to work from home for an emergency for a week or two. And of course, many companies don't have that, which is terrible, but many companies did have that for a week or two, hurricane, earthquake, something like that, major disruption in their in an area. And so they can move their staff to working from home. That's fine for a week or two. That's what they're prepared for, but it's not fine for the long term. It does not fit a pandemic. It does not fit these high impact, low probability, slow moving train wrecks like a pandemic or major other events or even permanent transition to working from home, which a number of companies are doing. This is unfortunately trying to adapt existing office culture to remote work in the long term is like forcing a square peg into a round hole. And they can make it work, but you'll tear off the corners. And the corners in this case are the social and emotional glue that protects us from burnout, that creates team collaboration, team cohesion, team learning, helps create trust, helps fulfill our needs. And so you'll force that square peg into the round hole, but you'll break off the corners. It'll be pretty wobbly and eventually it'll break. People will burn out. So that is a fundamental, fundamental reason of what's happening, the framework for which we have to understand the current wave of work from home burnout, as well as Zoom fatigue. What are the problems of this typical approach to work from home? Why is this causing burnout? Well, the typical approach of adapting existing office culture patterns, in office culture patterns, to work from home is that you're failing, the companies are failing to address basic differences of working from home. And if you're a solopreneur, you might be as well. There's really basic differences from working from home to working in the office as a result of which it leads to burnout. We'll talk about the problems in a little bit during the presentation. So the shape of this presentation will be, we'll be talking about the problems first that lead to working from home burnout, work from home burnout, and then we'll be talking about the solutions. So we'll be talking about the problems, but I want you to understand the basic framework of what's going on. It harms collaboration and productivity. When you're working from home, the productivity of individuals is improved, but the productivity of teams is decreased. It harms collaboration. Working from home harms team collaboration. We'll talk about why. 
What you want to understand and think about is that work from home requires a truly strategic approach. You need to have a strategic approach to have effective work from home. And the vast majority of companies do not have a strategic approach to working from home. They have a tactical approach. They shifted to working from home in March 2020, and then they used operational day-to-day -day tactics to solve challenges that as they came up, rather than stepping back and doing a reevaluation of their culture, processes, systems, and practices and technology to adapt effectively to working from home and to addressing work from home burnout and Zoom fatigue. There are two obstacles that I want to talk about as fundamentally, fundamentally problematic for a strategic approach to working from home. And as Robbie said, my background comes from behavioral science. I've studied cognitive neuroscience, behavioral economics, and other behavioral science topics for 15 years or so in academia. And I've learned about the mistakes that we make because of how our brains are wired. These mistakes are called cognitive biases, dangerous judgment errors that cause us to misjudge, make mistakes about how we approach working from home, how we approach using Zoom, what causes work from home burnout and Zoom fatigue. There are two mistakes I want to share about, anchoring bias. Anchoring bias refers to our minds being anchored to our initial experience. So our initial experience for the vast majority of us was March, 2020, making that emergency shift, making that emergency shift to working from home. And that emergency shift was fine for a short time period, you know, you wanted the emergency shift is about getting to actually addressing the emergency tasks, the tasks that need to be done by a company, the way that people collaborate together, tasks that are being done, that's what that shift was about. And that was pretty important, of course, to do. That was the most important thing to do. But that's, that's only fine for an emergency, not the long term. But companies were anchored and people were anchored to that initial experience and they continued that experience. They were anchored to that experience where they transposed their office culture style of work to working from home. And they continued that going forward, despite new data that this does not work very well, <laughs> despite new data that this leads to burnout, to Zoom fatigue and many other problems. So that's the first problem. The other problem is the status quo bias. That's a related but different distinct uh, bias, distinct dangerous judgment error, where we tend to stick with the established status quo. So we established a certain status quo. We are anchored to the initial experience. That's one. And so we interpret new data. That's in about interpretation of new data. That's about evidence in our head. This is about something different. This is about emotions. This is about how we feel. We tend to stick with the initial status quo, with what we have right now because it feels uncertain to change. It feels scary. It feels uncomfortable to change. So we choose this default option, which is sticking with what we have right now, even if it's problematic, unless we do a strategic shift. And the vast majority of companies don't do a strategic shift. They don't change the status quo in any meaningful manner. They might make smaller improvements around the edges, but not changing the fundamental status quo of transposing office culture into, onto their working from home patterns. And this is part of a broader practice of cognitive bias risk management. Working from home burnout and Zoom fatigue is just part of what you as continuity professionals need to understand about how we manage cognitive bias risks. Because cognitive bias risks, as increasing research is showing, are fundamentally important in addressing how we continue forward. We're making a lot of bad decisions, a lot of risks, a lot of harm, dangers to business continuity come from these cognitive biases. And the anchoring bias and status quo bias are just two of them. And I can talk about cognitive bias risk management much more deeply in the question and answer. And before we get to the actual problems, we're diving in depth into the problems, I want you to take a poll right now about your experience. I'd like to hear about whether your team adapted its existing office culture when transitioning to remote work. So the existing patterns of interacting in the office, did you adapt that when transitioning to remote work? Please go ahead and vote. You should be able to vote now. See about a third of you voted. Let's get the rest voting, make your voices heard. So three quarters of you. Okay, great. We're getting to almost 90%. I'll give you five more seconds to make your voice heard. Okay. 
Five more seconds. All right, so we see that three quarters of you is the case that your team adapted its existing office culture when transitioning to remote work. So this is a big problem, big challenge for the large majority of companies, like I'm saying, so it sounds like three quarters here. And that's going to be something that you need to be thinking about, the three quarters of you for whom it's the case. And of course, the others can pick up some useful tips, less than a strategic framework, but the rest of you, the large majority of you, will need to really be thinking about how to bring this information back to the office and make sure that you use it effectively and change people's behaviors and practices. All right, let's talk about what's going on. What are the problems? What are the issues? And so we'll talk about problems first and then solutions. Problem one, we are deprived. We are deprived of basic things that fulfill our needs in the office. We don't realize that the problem is not simply burnout. We, you know, we use terminology like burnout. We think it just comes from the work we do, and it doesn't. The fundamental thing that causes burnout that we don't realize, I mean, there are a number of things we realize, like stress, overwork, and so on. But what we don't realize is that work for us fulfills basic human needs, basic human needs of connection to others. We are tribal creatures. So when you look at the behavioral science research on who we are, our brains, our emotions, our feelings, our intuitions, our mind is actually not adapted for the modern environment. I mean, the modern environment has really been around since the 1990s, right? We haven't had time to adapt to it. Our mind is evolved for the savanna environment. The savanna environment, when we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people. So we are inherently, inherently tribal creatures and we very much depend on our sense of tribe. And for the large majority of us, the office members, other people in the office are a very important part of our tribe. Of course, we have our family, we have our community, but we also have our work. And that you know, is where we spend you know, nine to five, that's about half of our waking hours. Some people even spend more. I mean, and some, you know, some of the time is spent in commute. So we spent a lot of the time with other people at the workplace. And that they form for us part of our tribe. And so our work community is fundamentally important, key to our need for connection to others. Work from home is something that really deprives us of this need, this need, the psychological need that satisfies us, that makes us feel connected, that makes us feel close, that makes us, protects us from burnout. You know, little squares on the video conference screen as we're having right now, they just don't cut it. They don't cut it for us. We don't, they don't cut it for our tribal part of our brain, our emotions, our intuitions, our gut reactions, our instincts, which determine about 80 to 90% of what we do, well, how, what we think. When you look at the research, emotions are fundamentally important, 80%, 90% determining of what we do, how we feel, especially, of course, our needs, our psychological needs. Those are fundamentally shaped by our emotions. And so little squares in the video conference screen don't cut it. And that is a fundamental, fundamental key aspect of what causes work from home burnout. Problem two, you know, it's not simply Zoom fatigue, but before talking about Zoom fatigue as a topic, I want to ask you a poll. Do you think you and your team members would find it valuable to address the deprivation of the need for connection associated with remote work? So think about yourself and your team members. There's that connection that we have to each other. And has that been harmed for you in any way by remote work? And would it be valuable for you to address it? See about half of you voted. Let's make the rest, uh, help the rest of you have your voice heard. I'll give you about five more seconds. Wow, okay, so clearly we see huge, huge results. The large majority of you would find it valuable. Even some whose, adapt, whose office culture was better adapted perhaps to work, whose company is better adapted to working from home, there's still a deprivation of the need for connection that you get from members of your team associated with remote work. That's really important for you to know and understand that what's going on. And we'll talk about solving that in the second half of the presentation. So let's talk about Zoom fatigue. 
what is that? You know, this is about work from home, burnout, and Zoom fatigue. We have to understand what Zoom fatigue comes from. It's a real experience. You know, it's not kind of, you know, people aren't joking, people aren't making it up. It's a real experience that people have. I was just talking to a head of sales at a major pharmaceutical company, and he was telling me for the, the United States, and he was telling me that, you know, he worked in the office, he had meetings nine to five, and he right now has meetings nine to five in his office chair at home. In the office, when he had meetings nine to five, same time period, you know, same dynamics, he felt much less tired after coming home than he does now. And it's very weird, you know, he doesn't have a long commute, he doesn't have as many other things that he's doing when he comes into the office, little hassles. He just has the same amount of meetings, nine to five and nine to five, but he feels quite a bit more tired. And so I bet to you, it's not due to Zoom or other software, you know, we use the term Zoom fatigue. It's due to our expectations, due to our expectations. And that ties into the need for connection. When we have meetings, whether it's Zoom, professional meetings, team meetings, happy hours, all sorts of things, one-on-one. -on -one. We expect intuitively without thinking about it, intuitively our gut reactions, our intuitions, our emotions, our needs, our values, expect us to feel connected. We expect, we feel like we should be connected to our tribal members. But little squares on a screen, they don't cut it. They, we don't process video conferences as connecting, our emotions don't. We don't process those video conferences as connecting. And so that is a big problem that we feel like we should get that connection and we don't. And then we feel intuitively alienated, disappointed, fatigued, and drained without realizing what's going on. It's not a conscious experience. It's not like you self-reflectively think, I should get satisfaction from this meeting. I should get satisfaction from this Zoom happy hour. I should get the satisfaction from this weekly team meeting or something like that. You don't think that, but you feel that without realizing it. it's a subconscious process. That's why we're left feeling drained and disconnected. And that's what Zoom fatigue is about. I'm curious to ask you in another poll, do you feel more drained after video conference meetings than you would feel after similar length and intensity in-person meetings? So think about that, video conference meetings versus in-person meetings. Do you feel more drained after you have a similar length and similar intensity video conference meetings? About just over 50% of you voted. Let's get a few more. Five more seconds to give, make your voice heard. Great, so we see that for the majority of you, just about two thirds, it is the case that you feel more drained. The rest feel presumably equally or maybe a little bit less drained. But for the large majority of you, for about two thirds, it is the case that video conferences are quite a bit more training than in-person meetings of the same similar length and intensity. And we need to understand that that's what's going to keep happening because we have those expectations, we have those intuitions. And in office meetings, when we have those, whether we have professional meetings, whether we have one-on-ones, whether we have chats in the hallway with others or actual in-person happy hours, you know, even people who are extreme, except people who are extremely introverted, even moderately introverted people get some energy from interacting with others, at least some of their energy. They get some excitement, some energy, some feeling of connection from interacting with others. And you don't get that. And that energy in video conference meetings, not nearly as much in our expectations, cause us to feel drained and disconnected. So that's a big problem for us. Problem three, we're forcing a square peg into a round hole. This is a fundamentally important problem. So we talked about Zoom happy hours. They just don't work well. When you look at the research, when you look at people's practice, you know, maybe your experience, it just doesn't work very well at all because you're transposing in-person bonding events into virtual formats. That does not work out well. In-person events and on virtual formats, we have too high expectations, way too high expectations. It inevitably disappoints us, doesn't meet our needs. So that's about happy hours and those other bonding activities, they don't work well. 
Now, going on to a different problem than satisfaction of our needs and the Zoom fatigue. We have a lack skills in effective virtual communication and collaboration, which contributes to burnout as well. It's already hard to communicate effectively in person. There is a reason communications trainers used to get paid a lot of money for in-person communication. It's even more so when office teams become virtual teams. It becomes much more difficult to communicate effectively. When you communicate, your tone, your body language can show growing tensions, growing conflicts, surprise, anxiety, all of these sorts of stresses. And happy emotions, pleased emotions, satisfaction. When we communicate the verbal content of what we communicate doesn't carry our emotions unless we use emoticons and emojis and that you know many companies don't and even when you do it's very flat effect and people don't know when you're ironic when you're actually smiling winking all of those sorts of things when you're using text when the large majority of communication right now takes place through text through collaboration software like microsoft teams or slack or trello asana mondays stuff like that that doesn't communicate your emotions. And emotions are so, so important for connecting us and actually helping us interpret what we mean. Body tone, language, you know, that is really important. And people don't get that. So it's hard to notice tensions by, via virtual communications, hard to notice negative emotions, hard to notice positive emotions, hard to judge who's supporting you, who isn't, who cares about business continuity, who doesn't, who is, you know, just saying like they came, care, but they actually don't and they want to get the project done, happens so often. This results in a lot more conflicts, a lot more tensions because there's so many more miscommunications. This is a big problem, lacking skills in effective virtual communication and professional development. Let's go on to the next problem, the deprivation of mentoring and informal development. So this is another development issue. There's another skills issue, but this doesn't have to do with things that can be professionally trained. This has to do with informal mentoring and informal development. When you have mentoring and informal development, these things are critical for on the job learning. So when senior team members help junior team members know what to do, even without a formal mentoring program, just tell you, hey, you know, Susie, this is how you do this thing. This is how you file that report. Or, hey, I, John, this is, you know, who you should talk to for this issue or that issue. Those are really important kind of conversations to have in the company. We're just seeing how you're doing a job. These mentoring from senior colleagues, so important for our development. And we just observe what others do, how others speak, how others interact with each other, how others fill out reports, how others assess risks and formulate business continuity plans and so many other things, manage projects. We are missing all of that. And so especially junior people, younger people are missing these sorts of things or junior people for your company who have been with the company for a short period of time, don't know the culture very well. And that causes them to have more burnout because they're uncertain, they're anxious. They're, I mean, I know so many people are anxious and certain about what they're doing and they fear for their jobs more and for their performance more because they don't get this informal mentoring, informal development, observing their colleagues. And finally, problem six, poor work from home environments. This is a serious issue that has surprisingly not been resolved yet. I mean, I'm surprised daily when I see executives, I do executive training. And when I see executives working from, you know, something like their kitchen home and having bad quality mics and having internet issues, this is not good. And of course, this applies to all employees. Many employees just don't have the resources for good equipment. I'm not talking about executives. Executives should, but sometimes they don't even buy. I mean, I can't tell you, I was training, doing an executive training the other day on cognitive bias risk management. And there was one of the executives in the training who had a mic, so he was using his inbuilt mic for the conversation, for the Q&A, and everyone was missing like 25 to 30% of what he was saying, if not more. You know, not great, but so many people don't even know what they don't know. And many other people don't have the resources for good equipment, camera, microphone, of course, laptop, of course, internet connection, all of these sorts of things and they don't have the resources for a good quiet space. So we talked about the problems. Let's move on to solutions. The first solution for you, for your company, for you as a business continuity professional, for your company is to gather information on working from home. 
you want to diagnose the extent of work from home and remote work issues based on what I'm talking about here and on a white paper I'll send after the presentation, which goes quite a bit more in depth into these issues. So you want to diagnose the extent of issues for working from home, for remote work, and you, then you want to do things like surveys, focus groups, one-on-one -on -one interviews. So these are the kinds of things you want to use to diagnose the extent of these issues. What are they? Every company will have its own set of issues. So you don't want to simply generalize and say, these are the issues that all companies have. Every company will have a set of its own issues. So you want to know what's going on in your company. And by the way, I saw that somebody puts a Q&A into the question and answer. That's, it's good to do that while I'm talking through things. If you have a question, please put it in the Q&A. I'll get to it after, as we get go for the presentation and after the presentation. So please do put your questions in there in case you don't want to forget it and you want to just type it out there. Solution two, related to getting that information, you want to use it to develop metrics and baseline for interventions because you'll be doing interventions. So you want to know what's going on before you want, if you want it to be a very evidence-based intervention, know what's going on beforehand and then what the intervention is, what the impact of the intervention is, and then do another survey after it to see the effect of the intervention, how you can adjust it. So you want to get both quantitative and qualitative data in your surveys and in your, in your information gathering, especially quantitative data for your surveys. And that's why you should structure your surveys to get clear metrics on working from home. There are lots of questions like that. I can talk about them in the Q&A. And so you want to use these metrics to define the baseline of issues that you'll be dealing with. Next, you want to educate people about their needs. This is surprisingly important and surprisingly effective because people don't know why they're feeling burned out. They don't know why they have Zoom fatigue. They don't know, they don't realize what they're missing. They just think it's the job, it's the situation, whatever. They don't ne realize nearly enough about what's going on within them. L large majority of us are not nearly as self-aware as it would be, you know, beneficial for us to be perhaps. So you want to educate about needs because most employees, they're unaware of how work meets their psychological needs. As business continuity professionals, you tend to be more aware because you're looking at risks, you're looking at problems, you're looking at challenges, including of course, with people's problematic behaviors. But most other employees, and so honestly, a number of risk professionals who I talk to are not aware of their own psycholo psychological needs and those of other employees. So transition to working from home, as we talked about, disrupted the satisfaction of our needs, our needs for connection, other needs that are, is going, the white paper will talk about. And so workers feel both unfulfilled, much less fulfilled, and confused about why they're unfulfilled. And so they're blaming the job, they're blaming the situation, they're blaming the team, whatever's going on for their feeling of unfulfilled, whereas it's really coming from an internal need not being satisfied. So educating people about this topic will really help as an early intervention, address burnout, decrease dissatisfaction, increase satisfaction. Then cultivate mutual connections. You wanna really focus on these human connections to each other. Again, it's hard to connect by, by boxes and small screen, that's clear. This discontent this leads to, of course, as we talked about, Zoom fatigue, this emotional drain. So you want to replace office culture style bonding activities, whether team meetings, whether Zoom happy hours, lots of other things like this. And again, team meetings have their place, but much less often than people are doing them right now. Because right now, a lot of team meetings that are taking place because team leaders believe that these will help facilitate their team being connected and feeling mutual trust. In reality, when you look at the surveys and the research, more team meetings actually is often counterproductive and leads to more burnout. So there's a time and a place for team meetings only when they're necessary. And you know, no more than once a month. If you want to do a meeting, regular meeting, you should do them no more than once a month. Otherwise, you should gather your team to work through problems only, project teams or something like that. And you want to replace all sorts of office style bonding activities with activities that are native to the virtual format. Don't transpose your office culture to remote work. Develop native virtual format activities. And I will give you two examples that uh, I've had integrated into a number of companies that proved especially effective. One is a text-based morning update. These are all text-based. So whether in your Microsoft Teams, Trello, Asana, Slack, each team has a channel for itself. 
and each team should have a work channel that's separate, that's going to be separate from a team private channel, personal channel. So that's just for personal issues, not for work stuff. Where every morning, what you do is a morning update. You share how you're doing, how you're feeling, what's uh, new with you, with your life, what you're gonna be focusing on in work that day, and a fact about you that most team members don't know. That's all. And then you respond to team members who sh to, to at least three team members who shared their morning updates that day or earlier with whatever response you want to make to what's going on with them. That keeps us human to each other. That bonds us, that helps us feel connected, both when we share about ourselves and are vulnerable to whatever extent you want to be vulnerable about what's going on in our lives and kind of humanizing. You know. Yeah, I mean, you could say things, you know, I had delicious pancakes for breakfast and that's totally fine. Or, you know, I've had people say something like, oh, I've seen people say something like literally uh, for a company I was work I'm consulting for two days ago, a team member talked about seeing a pretty brutal shooting next to her and how she had to, you know, just take a little bit of time off for mental health and seek counseling to deal with it. So that was scary. And that's an example of something that really, you, you know, ideally team members would know each about each other. But of course, you don't know that if you don't have those updates and if you don't have that way of being connected. And if you don't humanize each other to each other, or you know, you post wedding pictures, post the things of your kids, whatever, and respond to others. So that's one. Then on the same channel, you use that for personal chats. So that's separate from a morning update. Morning update is obligatory for everyone. I want to be very clear: this is an obligatory activity. And you know, some people, you know, it just takes about it takes it takes about five minutes, five to seven minutes or so to do it. It's a very little time, very important for team bonding. You know, you cut down on meetings, you have plenty of time for that. Then you also use that channel for personal chats. And that's for you, whoever feels like it. You don't have to do it at all. You can just share about what's going on with you, your life. And so I find that the channel, that the personal chats, that's much more used by extroverts, whereas introverts tend to do more of the morning updates, but some of them who are especially moderate introverts do the more personal chats as well. Then training. Training and virtual communication collaboration is super effective, is easy to do, relatively speaking, but companies are not doing it. I'm, I'm shocked. Honestly, this is a, such a low hanging fruit. Companies used to do communication training, but they don't realize that they need to do virtual communication training, virtual collaboration training. They used to do teamwork training. I mean, this is I'm sorry, this, this is a pet peeve of mine. This is just something that is such a low hanging fruit for teams to do virtual, for companies to do com training in virtual communication and for virtual teamwork, for virtual collaboration, which are separate kinds of things, but you need to do both trainings. You know, poor collaboration derails morale, retention, productivity. This is terrible. And it really harms people's ability to not burn out if they have problematic communication and teamwork. Small misunderstandings in virtual settings blow up quickly. You don't have nearly as much ability to settle them. You don't have an ability to stop Bob in the middle of the hallway when you're passing by each other and chat to Bob and resolve an issue. That's not something that happens in virtual environments. There's no body language, no tone, you know, for most communication, which is chats, even which is text-based communication, even communication like this through Zoom, you know, so much is lost when you're a small square on a screen we can't see the, you can hear the person's tone, but you can't, you can only see their face body language, not their body body language. And there's so many other things that are lost. So that's not great. Provide training and virtual communication. That's one. Provide training and virtual collaboration. That's two. two. These are super low hanging fruit. This is, can be easily and effectively done. And I'm very surprised that more companies aren't doing it. So at this point, I'm going to ask you to do a poll. I'm curious about whether you or and or members of your team might benefit from professional development in virtual communication and or collaboration. See about just under two thirds of you vote. Let's give folks who haven't voted five more seconds to make their voice heard. Five more, a few more seconds and we're done. Wow, so yeah, we see that the vast, vast majority of you, 
would appreciate such training. So yes, clearly this is an area of need and clearly you realize, I don't know if you realized before the presentation or you realize now with the presentation, but this is a really important area, super low hanging fruit that can derive a great deal of benefits. All right. Let's talk about what else can be done. And here I want to talk about virtual mentorship. So virtual mentoring is really good for being connected and is also really good for helping those junior team members. So you want to pair up junior staff with senior team members for that virtual mentorship where senior team members mentor the junior team staff and provides a way of connecting and socializing. So you satisfy those needs at least somewhat virtually when you have that more personal interaction and when you have someone helping you, you when you have someone assisting you, you feel more connected to that person, even though it's virtual and it's not kind of that in the office experience. It, it helps you socialize, it helps you stay more human to each other when you have that connection, when you know you have that source of support. These older staff mem mentor, uh, by the way, by older, I mean more experienced. They might be younger actually, but more experienced in the company or the field. And then junior staff, I find, frequently help senior staff with technology. And there's a lot of issues with senior staff not knowing sufficient technology, not even knowing what they're not knowing, what they're missing, and not knowing that they should ask for help and being embarrassed to ask for help. It's much easier to ask for help when you're mentoring someone who's junior to you and you're helping them. And then it's kind of feels like reciprocity, which it is, and it's much easier to do that. So that's one solution for the observation and professional development, the lack of on the job professional development. And the other one is very valuable is establishing digital co-working. So let's talk about digital co-working, what that is. It's probably not something that most of you heard about. What you want to do is you want to replicate the benefits of shared cubicle space. This is what digital co-working is about, replicating those benefits where you work alongside the members of your team, of your six to eight people team, you work side along each other. So work alongside each other. It's very helpful, very useful. Here's how you do it. You do a team video call for one hour or more daily. So get on a team video call, everyone. Team video call, you have a set time, at least one hour. Some teams like to do more, you know, that's, but at least an hour obligatory for one hour or more per day. Where you have microphones off, you have speakers on and you have video optional. So some people like to have video, some people don't like to have video, that's fine. You want to definitely have your speakers on and you have microphones off. And what you do is you bond with each other, chat, answer questions, you talk about things, you talk about what's going on, you ask questions, sometimes nobody asks anything and that's fine. And you have microphones off, so you're not being distracted. But when somebody has a question, that's easy for somebody else to answer. And honestly, what I find is that people just you know, chat with each other for that hour about what's going on. You, know, you, you type quietly for five minutes, nobody can hear each other typing because the microphones are off and then somebody turns the microphone on and says something about you know, referring a morning update saying, oh, hey, you know, Dave, I saw that your daughter is you know, having a, a wedding in two weeks, that's wonderful. You know, what, where are they planning the wedding? Something like that, whatever. Uh, all of these sorts of things. And of course, a lot of work-related questions. You can build up those questions from the day before and then you can intend to address them in that video chat and that's very helpful. So digital co-working and that virtual and that uh, virtual mentorship, I find are very, very useful tools. And I want to ask you whether you think whether digital co-working and or virtual mentorship, might they prove valuable for you and your team? Digital co-working and or virtual mentorship. Please go ahead and vote. Either of those. So again, we're talking about either of those, whether they might prove valuable for you and your team. See, just over two thirds of you voted. Let's give the rest of you five more seconds. Go ahead and vote if you haven't yet. All right, so we see the, for the large majority of you, so over two thirds, so 71%, you definitely would like to do either digital co-working and, and or virtual mentoring. Great, so these are tools and techniques that you can take. And I'll, again, I'll send you the white paper after the presentation that describes the digital co-working, virtual mentoring in much more detail. These are tools, techniques that you can take 
and implement in the office pretty quickly, <laughs> especially the digital co-working. I find the virtual mentoring takes a little bit more work uh, if you're going to do it as a policy-wide thing. If you're just going to do it within your team, like as a team leader, you can assign a senior staff member to mentor a junior staff member, that's pretty easy. A digital co-working is pretty easy to establish in teams. It's also pretty easy to establish within a company because you kind of just talk about it, have the get by and have that, you know, have every, all the teams do it. Whereas virtual mentoring is a little bit more difficult for having a team, having a company-wide policy. But again, for a team, it's pretty easy to do. All right. Let's talk about the last thing that I wanted to share about as a solution. And this is addresses, of course, the issue with the lack of funding, lack of resources. You want to help people with tech and office space limitations. And that includes lack of knowledge. You know, if somebody doesn't know that they need a better microphone, they need a better camera, that's something that they should be informed about. And there should be standards established for, you know, this is the expectation for microphones. Here is a set of microphones that we approve, or you can have an equivalent microphone with good quality. Here's a standard for cameras. This is a set of cameras we approve and, you know, or an equivalent camera. Here is, you know, st standards for internet connection. And again, you can have some exceptions if somebody's in an area without broadband, but a large majority of folks will be in an area with broadband and they can upgrade their, comp their computers, their internet connections through getting funding. And then you want to provide funds for a good home office setup. That means all of, these all of this technology that I talked about, all of this equipment for internet connection, as well as for their office, as well as for their office to make sure that they can have a nice quiet office in their home that they can use for working at home because you don't want them to work in the kitchen. That causes a real decline in productivity, contributes to burnout, breaks down work-life boundaries, which contributes to burnout. You don't want to do that. So again, internet connection, equipment, and furniture for working from home effectively. All right. What I want to, you to know, so we talked about the solutions, but you want to be really thinking about integrating these changes over time. Don't just kind of have a slapdash approach of doing everything at once, integrate them over time. Don't rush things. You want to start with education about basic psychological needs. That's why I encourage. Then proceed to urgent steps based on the internal surveys. What your internal surveys indicate are the more urgent steps. And finally, you want to examine the survey results and strategize the next step. So take that in a step-based approach. Have that, have those surveys, have the education about basic psychological needs, and then see what the survey says and use that for the to inform your next steps. All right. And as I mentioned, I'll send you resources after the presentation to everyone on my white paper on how to defeat work from home, burnout, and Zoom fatigue. And then a digital copy of my best-selling book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business dis Disasters that Robbie mentioned. And finally, I have three open slots for coaching. So for the first three claimants, you just click on the link for coaching and you sign up. The first three people can sign up. If you click on it and you can't sign up, that means that that opportunity is gone. All right, everyone. So that's what I want to share. And that's now we turn to the Q&A. So what kind of questions do you have? Let's see what kind of questions were asked. So Steve says that you know, one of the problems he sees with Zoom meetings is that we're all on display for many hours. Voice conference calls can be better in that you don't have to worry about appearance and can focus on the topic at hand. Yeah, that's definitely true that you don't have to worry about appearance. On the other hand, you miss even more of the body language of the person who is speaking. So that's gonna be a problem for the actual communication collaboration. So there's trade-offs to make. So you want to understand that there's, you're going to be more drained, especially more people who are more introverted are drained by bidding on video, but your people who are extroverted tend to be not so drained by bidding, being on video, but you'll miss out on, everyone will miss out on body language. Sam asks, how does this vary by generations, boomers versus millennials versus generation Z? I mean, you won't be surprised that people who are of the older generations tend to be less comfortable with technology, tend to be less comfortable with remote work. People who are younger, uh, you know, the Gen Z, whatever, millennials, especially Gen Z, tend to be more comfortable with remote work, tend to be more comfortable with technology. So Pam asks, 
what a virtual communication in what a virtual training and communications would entail. Don't we already know how to communicate? What communication would be beneficial in a virtual world? <laughs> I mean, this uh, I'll be happy to talk about this. Uh, the start for Pam, Pam is that most people don't realize what they're missing. They're not realizing that they're missing the emotional tonality of what's going on, you know, and they don't realize that the emails, messages that they're getting are not actually conveying what the person is intending to say. So we don't realize that we're not communicating emotions, not nearly enough with what we're saying. When I say something like, I think Mary should take that project, or I say, I think Mary should take that project. Those two th sentences mean very different things. But when I just type them out, they mean the same thing. And people don't know that they're not communicating effectively when they're doing that. And people who are receiving the communication, text-based communication, don't really realize that the person meant to communicate one thing, but they're communicating another thing for this virtual communication. That's just one thing. Then how do you actually recognize body language and tone that's missing? How do you try to interpret it to see what the person's emotions might be, emotional tonality, what they might, they might actually mean by these messages? And there's a lot of tips and tricks for virtual communication training for how you figure these things out. Then there's very simple things. So right now I am looking at the camera. I am not looking at the screen where, where you're located in small squares. The vast majority of people, when they communicate with each other, they, including when they're leaders who are trying to influence other salespeople, business continuity professionals, when you're trying to encourage people to be mindful of risks, are looking at the small squares on the screen. Let me show you what that looks like. So I'm looking at the camera right now. Now I'm looking at you small squares on the screen. Do you see the difference? Again, I'm looking at the camera right now, looking at the camera looking at the small squares on the screen with the vast majority of you are looking at the large majority of the time. The difference is eye contact. You know, how, how often in communications training are you taught to do eye contact? And in virtual communication, eye contact means always looking at the camera, not looking at the other people on the screen. But the vast majority of us don't know how to do that. And they don't, they don't know that we should be doing that. And when we miss eye contact, you know, how much are we missing in our ability to influence and communicate and persuade people? And that's just some of the little, many little things that are different about virtual communication versus in-person communication. So one of the attendees asks, does the commute have emotional value? Provide separation between work and home and it's time to think and depressurize. Yes, the commute can provide that. That's definitely valuable. One of the things about training for effective work from home is how to create your own commute experience, how to create that own space to depression, to have that break between work and home life. And that is part of training and adaptation to effective work from home, so that effective culture. That's something that the vast majority of companies don't do. They don't train people on having those breaks and this, developing those patterns, which need to be individualized to people. You can set up a lot of things to do that, both before and after work, especially after work, so important. And that is something that uh, just not being done, not people are not being trained of. Mara asks, with burnout, do people often experience symptoms and physiology before being really aware of what's wrong or happening? Um, it depends on the person. So as a person, for example, me, when I experience when I experience drain fatigue, that for me indicates that I'm experiencing psychological stress. And that's me as an individual. That's how psychological stress happens in me. Other people, when they experience psychological stress, when they're burnout of various sorts, drain, what they experience is a sense of anxiety or a sense of depression. So it translates into mental symptoms. I also experience anxiety to a lesser extent. It translates into mental symptoms where anxiety, feeling of threatened, feeling of anxiety, feeling of rumination, depression, feeling of sadness, feeling of dismotivation, feeling that, you know, things increasingly don't matter, feeling apathetic. So that's where burnout can express itself as well. So it really depends on the person and their physio, their, their, their psycho, psychophysiology. So there are ties between their mind and their body, which really are different. Some people experience that as stomach pains, you know, ulcers and so on. So it really depends. Uh, Teresa asks whether larger teams experience more burnout versus smaller teams. Um, I haven't found that in particular, 
I find that, uh, well, let me rephrase it this way. You might be talking about larger teams in terms of a team of 20 people that has one single leader versus a team that's six to eight people, that's one. And the other dynamic might be team in a smaller company versus team in a larger company. I have found that teams in, I, I rarely see large people of the 10 to 20, the large teams of the 20 you know, size or something like that. That's just inefficient teams. I, I mean, I have to be honest, leadership research has shown that we can't effectively lead a team of more than eight people unless there are super specific circumstances. And if it gets to more than that, it's the communication that leaders have to do eats up more of their time than they can effectively spend on managing the team and getting their own work done. So there's other problems if you have a team that's more than eight people, and especially if you have a team more than 10 people. But if you have a team more than eight people, you have other problems. But for the difference between larger companies and smaller companies, I don't really see a difference between, it just really depends on the culture in the company and the kind of stress and pressure on the company some small companies have leaders that are really devoted to work from to work life balance and some larger companies also and the opposite for a number of others so i don't see a stronger correlation i do see that there's more hr protection at larger companies so there's more protection for those work from home benefits and that i do see Oh, thank you, Jill. I really appreciate that. You said that this was a wonderful presentation. Looks forward to receiving the white paper and reading your book. Yep, we will be sent. So work from home is not just one person at home. How do you know how to share time and resources? So is, do you mean that there are a number of people working from home and you need to collaborate with other members of your family? So sharing time, sharing resources. I'm not quite sure what you're asking, Walter. So if you can rephrase your question, retype it, that would be helpful. Dr. Glad, we have about 60 seconds left. Um, Great. What I'm thinking is, can we offer up the, the, the questions that were not answered or if there are any additional ones they can email you because you're excellent at responding to emails and there are a couple other questions on here I would love to hear your answer to. Okay, so you know, do I have time for a couple more questions before we go? Take one more. Okay, one more. What are your thoughts on the mixed schedule, Rachel asks, with some working from home and some working in the office on staggered days? Does this historically impact the group in a negative manner? Uh, we don't have too much experience of people with staggered schedules, but we do know that the vast majority of employees want a staggered schedule. So when we look at surveys of employees, of people who want to work from home, uh, I'm sorry, people who want to work from home full-time, that's about 15 to 20%. People who want to go back to the office full-time is something like 10 to 15%. When the rest of the people want, when the more than half the people want to work at home, want to work in the office less than three days a week. So two days or less. When you look, give people options, one day, two day, three days, four days, full-time. So people are going to be less satisfied if they don't have work from home schedules, if you, have part, if you don't have part of the team working from home at least some of the time. And of course, companies save a lot of money by being able to shrink their space. So you have both more satisfied employees and save money. And of course, it provides more bonding than you would get otherwise. So as long as you have appropriately staggered schedules where each team member can see other team members for some of the time at least, you can definitely make it work from my experience, but I don't have strong research data on that because we haven't done too much research on it. All right, so. And we're right at two o'clock, Dr. Glass. Thank you so very much. This was very informative. Some of the feedback we've already gotten. Um, pleasure to hear you speak. For those in the audience, uh, I just want to mention our webinars are posted later on today. will be one posted on business continuity role and operational resilience by Kim Hirsch at Fusion. And don't forget that these webinars can be used for DRII continuing education activities uh, and BCI as well. So everybody, please stay well. Um, get your vaccine, wear your mask, wash your hands. All of you take care. We'll see you on the next webinar. Dr. Cliff, thank you so much. Thank take you, care, everyone. Bye-bye.